Hi guys, I am here with Eve Rodsky, the author of Fair Play, and we were at a book signing here tonight in Arizona, and you have been traveling the country. Harper's Bazaar named you one to watch in 2020. Reese Witherspoon uh, said that you were like the outstanding author of October, and you were on the New York Times bestseller list. Tell us about Fair Play. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction, Carrie. And I could go on yeah, and on. Well, right? you were such a wonderful <laughs> interviewer, so thank you for being here tonight. Um, fair play. Well, I like to say it's a book I was born to write because at seven years old, um, this started with me in a single mom household with my mother and me and my brother and Avenue C and 14th Street where eviction notices would come under our door and I'd wait up for my mom at night to show her it was time to pay our rent. And I started to notice the difference between regular bills and late bills with the final notice on them saying, please pay this or you know, water doesn't get shut off. Um, and from an early age, I vowed that that wasn't going to be my life, that I would have an equal partner in life. I would stay married and we would do this uh, domestic thing together. Yeah. And I married Seth and we felt very fair and equal. We took turns doing dishes. We took turns ordering out food for each other when we had a little apartment in New York City. We um, helped each other support our careers. Well then, as I write in Fair Play, cut to two kids later, and I find myself literally sobbing on the side of the road, and I say, thank you, Seth, for sending me this text, where Seth sends me a text, and it just said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. Carrie, you can picture the scene, right? I had a diaper bag and a breast pump on the passenger seat of my car. I had gifts to return for my newborn baby, Ben that had just been born in the backseat of my car. I was speeding to get to my older son Zach's three-year-old toddler transition program. I'm a lawyer, so I had a client contract <laughs> on my lap as I was trying yes. to mark it up with a pen that was stabbing me in the vagina as I was trying to write it up between each traffic stop. And then I get this text, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And I just pull over to the side of the road. I know I'm gonna be late to pick up Zach, and I just started I just started sobbing and I said this this was not supposed to be my life I vowed it wasn't gonna be my life I used to manage employee teams and now I can't even apparently manage a grocery list and more importantly how did I become the default or as I call in fair play the she fault for every single household and domestic task and so that so, took me on a seven-year quest to find out whether this was happening to other women as well and you interviewed 500 plus people. Yes, now probably even more, Yeah. but 500 before publication. Um, and I intentionally mirrored the U.S. Census. So that's what took so long. So what was the question you were asking them? What, well, first, it was different parts of the research. So first I was asking, what is invisible that you may be doing in your household that your partner and your children may not see? So that was the first question I was asking. And I was asking that mainly to women at first. Yeah. And that resulted in what I call in the book the shit I do spreadsheet. Yeah. It became a 98 tab spreadsheet with about 20 sub items. If you know Excel, right, you know that it could get really long and big. So much so that I had women I didn't even know saying I received your spreadsheet and I noticed you forgot sunscreen. Yeah. And then I would say, well, no, um, in the shit I do spreadsheet, uh, if you go to tab number 58, under item number nine, medical and healthy living, you'll see a pl application of sunscreen. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was very granular. Well, All so the was things like, that moms do. Yeah. It was everything that moms do, it was yeah. everything that women are doing for their partners that may be invisible. It became 98 tabs, including things like pet care and school lunches and weekend meals and in-school service and medical and healthy living, even allowance, giving allowance. Someone said, you forgot allowance. I said, well, no, it's in there. It's number tab number 98. <laughs> it's called family values and traditions. Under item number 11, you'll see allowance. Because why else are you giving allowance unless you're setting some sort of family value? So it was very granular. So that should I do spreadsheet um, really unleashed when I finally sent it to Seth with all this hope because every other book before Fair Play said, make a list. Um, some said even more solutions like strike or divorce, but even the most helpful said make a list. I did. I made the most beautiful list you can imagine. And still when I sent off this 19 million megabyte spreadsheet to my <laughs> husband, Seth, I got just one monkey emoji back. I got that sad monkey that's covering its eyes. And that's when I realized lists alone don't work. Mm -hmm. Systems do. And for a decade, 
I had been working in family mediation uh, to work with highly complex families to set up systems for family harmony around their family foundations and their family businesses. Mm -hmm. And when I put that hat on and said, can I use this learning of the 10 years over a decade of experience working with these families? Um, once I created a system and not just a list, that's when things changed. So why did you want to put this into a book and what are you hoping to accomplish um, in reaching out? Not just to, to it's not an anti-man no, book. No, no. No, and I will say, what I say about Fair Play is that it started as my love letter to you, to all women out there, and my beloved Should I Do spreadsheet. It started as a love letter to women. But what's happened is it's become a love letter to men. Because what I realized is that no one was asking men about domestic life. And so in all, interview after interview, men said to me, I don't do things for my wife anymore because anytime I try, I do everything wrong. Or they were saying to me, I don't know my role. Or when I come in, my family's a well-oiled machine and I come in from work and they're all rolling their eyes at me or saying, oh, dad doesn't know how to do things. It doesn't feel good for men either. And there's real beauty in inviting men into their full power in the home. And so I like to say this is really a love letter to men as well because the current system of nagging and being in charge and criticizing and getting, figuring out things on the fly doesn't work for women or men. And so what have you gleaned from the women and the men that you've talked to over the course of writing this book, traveling, going on these book tours, which we were here tonight, you had yeah. a packed house. Yes. What are people saying to you? Well, I think the most interesting finding so far is that when I've had a slew of emails, hundreds of emails have come into info at Eve Rodsky, which means people have to actually find me and reach out. And my assistant, the woman who's helping me collate all of the emails said 65% are men. That's a new thing that I'm learning. That the beauty of this is that I realize it doesn't have to be women initiating these conversations. Yes, I ask women. I say be the heroine of your own life, not the victim. And so if you're feeling resentful, I am asking you to initiate. Doesn't mean I'm just asking you alone to play. There's a, this is a two-player game. Yeah. But I am asking women to initiate if they are the ones who are feeling resentful and aggrieved or in same-sex partnerships, the person who's doing more in the home. But the cool thing that I found, the most interesting finding, is that men are asking to play the games. They're asking for the cards. They're um, asking for their spouse to read the book. They're helping to do the really hard work, and they're actually initiating the reading of Fair Play. So even though it's a book written for women, or written with a lens of looking at women, um, my amazing amount of supporters have been men. So you talk about um, like kind of spreading the glitter all yes, over yes, and, yes. And, and, and kind of living your best life. What do you want the audience to know about that? What I would like the audience to know is that my ultimate takeaway is that an hour holding your child's hand in the pediatrician's office is as valuable to society as an hour in the boardroom. Once we truly believe that, I believe things will change because it means that men, especially men who are primary breadwinners, will do it. They will sit in those pediatricians' office because they'll understand the value of that. I mean, just in closing, what has this felt like for you, this journey? So you had this moment in your own life, in your own marriage, you're a brilliant attorney, very accomplished. I mean, you've gone to incredible, you know, uh, Ivy League schools and, and all this and that. And then you found yourself in that mom moment where you're like, I didn't pick up the blueberries from the store. W what is my life? Correct. And so you had that moment. And, and what has this felt like for you kind of sharing that and opening up that discussion for thousands and thousands of, of people across the country? It's a good question. You're making me cry. It's <laughs> not many, no one's done before. I think. Um, Thinking about it that way, it's been very imp impactful because I think about other women who are sitting there in their blueberries moments where maybe they feel like their life didn't turn out the way that ex they expected or that they don't have the partner that they married. Like I had a partner who was super fair when I married him and then kids came along and like the statistics show, men do 15 hour, five to 15 hours a week less after kids. Like something weird happens whether we call it patriarchy or whatever we want to call it. I don't really care about what we call it. I care about the solutions. So when I was that less vibrant person, um, I really did feel resigned to do it all, that there was no solutions for me. And so I guess the beauty of this, in this place now where 
the systems and the dynamics of my marriage have completely changed because we're playing fair play every day. Um, I will say that I think anything is possible. Yeah. Because if, um, yeah, I'll say anything is possible. If Seth can do it, and I see men of all socioeconomic statuses, all ethnicities, embracing these messages of I want to know my role, I want to be an active participant in my home life, and that's really what the beauty is. Is that for men, for men to invite them, invite them to step into their full power in the home, so that we can step as women into our full power in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching, guys.